usually when people ask me to give talks, they're interested in the amplitude side of things. So they're inviting Matt von Hippel, moderately successful amplitudes researcher. Today, instead, you're getting forgravitons.com, moderately successful outreach blog. Um, so to be a little more specific about what I mean by moderately successful, I've been blogging since November, 2012. So it's been almost nine years now, which makes me feel a little older than I'd like to. Um, and my blog for Gravitons does physics outreach aimed at a very general audience. Um, so it's supposed to be accessible to anyone who's got at least sort of a high school background in mathematics and often not even that. Um, something that anyone from kids to my grandparents are able to read. And I cover various different topics. Sometimes I'm talking about black holes. Sometimes I'm talking about the details of my own work on scattering amplitudes. Um, and in addition, there's a lot of discussion about just what it's like to be a physicist, what kinds of things we spend our life doing. And in, part of the goal is to sort of humanize scientific research, to make people feel that scientists aren't these sort of mysterious experts hiding in a tower somewhere, but that they do things because they have good reasons to. I post once a week, every Friday. This is mostly because if I posted any more loosely than that, I would just completely forget and never post again. So I have to keep up the schedule. Um, but it's meant that over time I've built up a lot of posts. So I've got over 400 um, from all the way back in 2012. On a typical day, I get about 100 unique visitors coming to the blog. When I've got a new post up, it gets a little higher than that, 150. So that's sort of what I mean by moderately successful. Um, but occasionally, this gets noticed by bigger outlets. So for example, I um, relatively recently did an article for the magazine Scientific American. OK, so if this level of moderate success sounds good to you, um, then you may ask, well, how do you achieve this? How do you become a moderately successful outreach person? Well, there's kind of two questions I can break this into. On the one hand, you might ask me, what does it take to do outreach well? That's its own kind of question. It's a different question from the question, what does it take to get noticed? What does it take to get clicks, to get views? These aren't quite the same thing. And in this talk, I'll kind of give two different pieces of advice for each one. So for the first question, how to do outreach well, my main piece of advice is to treat your words like you have a budget. I'll explain what that means later. But to get noticed, that's a bit of a different skill. And what I found is that the best way to get noticed is to get into a lot of stupid arguments with people. So I'll discuss both of these as I go on. As Alex mentioned, I started out doing my PhD at Stony Brook University. Stony Brook has this fun center in it called the Center for Communicating Science. It was founded by this guy, Alan Alda. Uh, you might recognize him from the old TV show, MASH, or I think he was a presidential candidate in the last season of West Wing, a few things like that. Um, but the reason he did this, he founded the center was because he also worked um, for the American Public Broadcasting uh, Channel doing a, a a science show. And so he was the host and he'd go out and he'd interview scientists. And what he noticed was that as long as scientists were communicating kind of casually, if they were just chatting with him about what they were interested in, they were great communicators. You know, the conversation would flow and they'd be careful explaining things and it would all be very engaging. And then as soon as he put a microphone in front of them, completely failed they'd start throwing out technical jargon, they'd trip over their words. Um, it just didn't work at all. And so what he did was he wanted to found a center that would try to teach scientists how to communicate their work better. 
And so that's what the center is about. And there are a lot of different kinds of programs they do. They've got journalists to teach scientists how to talk to the media. They've got um, people who do online publishing to try to teach them how to build an online platform. They've got writing experts just trying to teach them how to streamline writing. But the core and sort of the aspect that is kind of unique about this center is improv. So in addition to all of those more obviously useful things, they also teach scientists improvisational theater. And this may seem a little random and irrelevant, but improv skills really are science communication skills. The core things you have to do in both tasks, there's a ton of overlap you need to hold your audience's interest to be quick, to be bright, to have vividness, and to get people to pay attention. You need to tell a lot with a little. In both improv and science communication, you've only got a little bit of time to get a message through. You need to make it count. And finally, you need to listen to your audience. You need to hear their reactions, hear, are they laughing? Are they losing track? And tailor what you do to how they're responding. And in light of this, by the way, if you want to interrupt me with questions at any point in this talk, feel free. Usual disclaimer. Now, to kind of give you an illustration of how these skills exist, both in improv and science communication, I want to do a little, um, you might call it an improv game. So just sort of a little small scale improv activity. I'd like someone watching this talk to suggest some object. And what I'll do is I'll try to make that object appear. A teacup. Okay, sure. Let me stop sharing the screen so I can do this. Okay. So you want a teacup, right? Well, you've got in general some little cup shaped thing, obviously, but the hook is kind of the most important part. You need to be able to hold it. And, you know, maybe right now it's empty, right? I can just wave it around, but, you know, it's clinking a little bit. But then I can put it down, I can grab my teapot from over here. It's kind of heavier, so it's tipping back and forth. Pour, try to avoid splattering my hand with hot tea. Put it back gently. Okay, and then I've got the teapot, the teacup, and now it's filled with tea. It's nice and warm. It's good on a cold day like this. I can blow off the steam a little bit. Okay, nice. I was a little worried someone would make me do a coffee cup instead. I'm not a big fan of coffee, but tea is good. Um, anyone have another object suggestion? Okay. All right, well then maybe I'll move on. So back to the actual talk. There we go. Okay. And let me know if this isn't full screen or if this doesn't move. Um, so I, I use this phrase, treat your words like you have a budget. To be clear, by a budget, I don't mean a word count. That does matter. In general, I find outreach is works much better if you have relatively short pieces. So this little panel here, um, before this talk, I had a bit of fun looking through, um, I, I blog using the site WordPress and they keep statistics on each post. And so I can sort of look up various different things. And so if you see these kind of white panels in this talk, they're stats that WordPress gave me. So these are the average words per post for each year that I've been blogging. And as you can see, they're hovering around five or 600 maybe closer to 700 in some years. So that's kind of what I aim for, roughly these 500 word chunks. 
enough to get a concept across without losing P. That's an important skill, but it's not what I mean by word budget. Instead, what I mean is a budget for individual terms. Each word you introduce to your audience that's unfamiliar, it could be a technical term or just something that sounds a little unusual. Each one of these words is work for your audience. Each time you introduce a new term, it makes it harder for them to understand what you're saying. It slows them down. You do still need some new words, some technical terms like this, because they help your audience hang their concepts, stick them to, in place so they can find them later. So that's what I'm doing with word budget here. That's sort of the word that I'm hammering in so that you follow it in the rest of the talk. But in general, you want only a few of those, sort of like with the teacup, right? You want a few different signs, the hands cupped around it, the finger blowing on it, a few little crisp images to get something across, and no more than that. Some of this idea might feel a little obvious. Obviously, you don't want to use technical terms when you're talking to the public. They're not going to understand them. But in practice, I think scientists find this hard because we forget what the technical terms are. So I can give you an example from my time at Stony Brook. These science communication classes, um, a large number of the students in them were from the marine biology department. I think they were required to take the class or something. You'd think that these people would have a very easy job of describing what they do. These are people who, for example, go and rescue baby sea turtles and study what they eat. That seems like it should be very, very easy to describe to the public and get them excited. But when they actually talked, these young graduate students, they'd been trained to speak precisely and technically. And so when they actually talked about these adorable sea turtles, they sounded a bit like this. So I've found an a abstract of a paper that was published around the time I was in grad school out of Stony Brook. And while this, isn't, this paper wasn't directed to the public, the students that I knew at the time used similar words. They'd talk about the benthic community, or they'd you know, describe changes to different trophic levels. you forget that these words that you're using every day are actually technical terms that are going to be unfamiliar to people. So just as a little exercise, anyone in the audience want to suggest a better way to say, say, benthic community? I'm well, speaking for myself, but it seems that no one knows what it is. <laughs> Aha, okay. Yes, that's plausible too. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's the problem. So, so benthic has to do with the ocean. So the benthic community is just a very technical way of saying the animals in the ocean. Um, and that's literally all it means. But, you know, when you drop that word into a talk, as you can say, see, people aren't going to understand it. Now, as physicists, we have a lot of these things too. And there's two types of these kinds of technical terms that are particularly dangerous. One of them is sometimes you'll use a technical term that sounds like an everyday term. This can be very risky. So to tell another story from my time as a PhD student, back then there were sort of two uh, classes of students. There were those of us who already knew quantum field theory, mostly because they'd done a master's in Europe and the people who did not know quantum field theory yet. And these people were thrown into classes together and had to do, for example, um, journal club activities. So at some point we had one of these kind of journal club style classes and one of the people who already knew quantum field theory, unlike me, um, got up 
and started talking and described a theory. I don't remember what it was. It might've been string theory. It might've been the two zero theory. Um, described this theory and said it was not an effective field theory. And I raised my hand and said, well, what makes it ineffective? And they said, well, it's UV complete. You know, you don't set a scale, just works to any scale you want. There's no divergences. And I said, well, that sounds very effective, right? That sounds like the most effective theory I could imagine. That's a very good theory. The problem is effective field theory is a technical term. Um, it means something very specific in physics that's not just the intuitive meaning of this theory is effective at what it does. So when you use a term like that, you have to be especially careful to tell people this is not what you think it is. This is a term with a specific meaning. And if you do that well, you can link the meaning to the everyday meaning. So you could say, for example, an effective field theory is one that's effectively true at some scale, but not at other scales. The reverse of this is that sometimes you'll use a term that isn't really a technical term, but sounds enough like one that it's a problem for your audience. So to give an example from my time at Perimeter, um, there was a, someone giving a public lecture who was describing some medical tests you can do on an eye. And she mentioned looking for a pupillary response. Now pupillary response, that's not a hard phrase to unpack, right? A pupillary response, it's a response of a pupil. You're shining a light into someone's eye, seeing what happens to their pupil. That's you know, not a very hard thing to understand. But it does require that step of reasoning, that little cycle in your mind where you say, oh, a pupillary response, that's a response of the pupils, that's dot, dot, dot. And by putting in that little bit of effort, it slows you down. It means you've got a chance of missing whatever the speaker said next. It means that the next time you've got one of these terms, you have to put in that much more work, and maybe that's the straw that breaks your attention and you lose interest. So these kinds of terms are especially risky. And if at all possible, you really want to talk in not just non-technical terms, but everyday language. Hmm. So, that's kind of the core of my advice about communicating. I think everything else really boils down to that sort of set of skills. But if you communicate very well, you still have an important question, which is, well, are people going to actually read it? And in my experience, yes. If you communicate well, people will indeed read it. So here's stats I've gathered on my top N, I forget exactly what N is here, posts. Um, a lot of people just go to the homepage, but there's a variety of posts after that. And you can see that, you know, a lot of the top ones are getting hits in the thousands. So there are at least thousands of people who want to read science popularization. There is an audience out there for people like us. That said, people aren't going to read it immediately, which kind of gets into the next part of my talk about how to get attention. You'll notice that the first few years, so here I've got a month by month and year by year breakdown of the views on my blog. This is another one of these little statistics pages from WordPress. First couple years, I had just, you know, 100 or 200 views a month. First couple months, rather. And then something happens here. There's a big peak. And one way of thinking about what happened here is I got into an argument. That's perhaps a little glib of a way of putting it. So to go into a bit more detail. 
Um, I started this blog as part of these science communication courses. And it turned out that the person teaching one of these courses was the science, was one of the science editors for a website called Ars Technica. For those of you who haven't seen it, Ars Technica is kind of like Wired. It's one of these tech news sites. Um, and I put up my first post and said, well, one of the ways you can describe me is I'm a string theorist. And this guy objected. He said, you know, I find it really annoying that you folks use the word, the phrase string theory. It's not a theory. A theory is something tested. It's something that has many, many experiments behind it. String theory has no experiments. Why would you ever call it a theory? And what I had to explain to him is that as theoretical physicists, that's just not how we use the word theory. Theory means something else to us. It's a way to refer to particular combinations of fields. But many of the things we call theories, of course, we don't intend them to have anything to do with the real world to begin with, like n equal four super yang mills. He was eventually persuaded by this and asked me to give a asked me to write an article for the website. So I did, and that started bringing the views in. Now, I should say that this title was not something I chose. Earning a PhD by studying a theory that we know is wrong. It's, it's pithy, but it's perhaps a little edgier than I would have gone for. Um, a general thing that's worth knowing about any news site you run into online the title is never the author of the piece's fault, almost never. Titles get changed by editors at the last minute because they think it will get more clicks. Nobody else is in control of this. This is apparently just how the world works. So if you ever publish something on one of these yeah, sites. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but isn't this exactly kind of one of the issues that if you enter the territory when you are trying to get the views, now you have to play by the very stupid rules of how internet works. So you have to start to become stupid yourself or you have to do this title. So this is kind of in the opposite direction where you want it to go. So in a sense, like your goal is to educate people, but to gain the views, you have to, in a sense, do the exactly the opposite. You have to go down the way, but basically the, the stupid the, the title is, the more views you will get roughly. That's a direct correlation, right? So how do you deal with that? Do you have any like suggestions for that or ideas? Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, this is kind of the core, and this is kind of why I was suggesting there's two very different questions you can ask, and they have different answers. Um, I will say that I'm not convinced that the uh, sort of title optimization that these people do is actually that well established, as in, Yes, you can get more clicks by being a bit more edgy, but ultimately, I don't know if they're actually making decisions based on the huge, you know, amount of studying these kinds of things, or if just they're doing it based on instinct. Um, and I think it varies probably publication to publication how well founded this is. But yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the core dilemmas here. Push one direction, you explain things well, but don't get a lot of views. Push the other, you annoy people but at least you get attention. You don't do any good education if nobody reads it. You don't do any education if you're controversial and nothing else. I'm gonna come back a little later to where I think you can draw the balance. So after that, people actually started reading it. And you can kind of see over the next few years, a few more of these kinds of interactions each time boosts readership. So in 2013, um, Amplitude's people will remember that was the age of the amplitudehedron. And there were a lot of popular articles about that. And so people started looking up Amplitude's blogs, including my own. 2014, Sean Carroll tweeted out a link to one of my posts. And once again, there's a bit of a jump in views then. And then you can see it's kind of stable in 2015, and then things basically double in 2016. So you might ask, okay, what, what happened then? Is there a lesson we can learn from whatever happened in 2016? Well, 
and to be more specific, so here's another little stat bar. And this one tells me, among other things, the day I had the most views ever. That day was May 19th, 2016. So something happened not just in 2016, but in May 19th, 2016. So what was that? Well, of course, as I've been suggesting, it was a stupid argument. Some of you have heard of Lubos model. He's a string theory blogger who I think used to be faculty at Harvard, now has mostly left the field. Um, and he started commenting on my blog after I weighed in on an argument between him and another blogger back in 2015. He started out friendly, I think, because at the time I was one of the few people who was kind of pro string theory on my blog. Most people were opposed on some level. Um, but gradually he realized that we have very different perspectives on many different things. And this made him more and more hostile. And he started nitpicking all sorts of rather trivial things and going off on tangents. And um, eventually this kind of behavior peaked May 19th, 2016, um, when he looked at a post where I was trying to clarify something about how string theory works and concluded I was incompetent. Um, so that was sort of the most views, was him having this post where he's extremely mad at me. But he keep, kept commenting on the blog until 2018 or so, when things sort of trailed off, and then finally he lost interest. Still, if you look at the people who've commented on the blog by number of comments, he's pretty near the top. There's only a few people who've commented more than him, even though he hasn't commented in three years. So there was a lot of activity there. So the moral you might draw from this is that if you get into stupid arguments with people, it drives traffic. This is true. People come in, they want to see what's going on. They'll come and take a look. But what I want to be clear about is that that's not really the only thing that drives traffic. So here is the same list of posts by number of views. But now what I've done is I've color-coded them a little. So these red posts are what you might call stupid arguments. Hmm. So these are situations where I got into an argument with one blogger or another. Um, several of these are arguments with Lubos model. Um, one of them is the argument that got him interested in the first place with another blogger as well. Um, this one is something in which I invited a guest post and someone struck up an argument with a Nobel Prize winner. Um, so those are part of the top posts. They get a lot of views. These yellow ones aren't arguments with specific people, but they're what I might call controversial topics. In particular, they're topics that crackpots tend to pay a lot of attention to. So this top post the way you think everything is connected isn't the way everything is connected. It's about this whole everything is connected slogan. And so I think a lot of people view it just because they're interested in the kind of woo sort of, um, you know, mystical everything is connected thing. Um, and because people get into a lot of arguments about that, that post gets views. And similarly, this is a post about zeta function regularization which involves um, the claim which people often summarize as when you add up all the natural numbers, you get minus 112. This tends to strike certain people the wrong way, and so it tends to get people's attention too. So these kind of red and, or red and yellow posts, you might say, are this kind of thing. But the green posts are something else entirely. These green posts, they're posts about science. They're posts about scattering amplitudes, actually. They're posts about the kind of stuff we research. And they're right up there near the top. 
right up there among all the controversial posts. So this is me trying to tell you that you don't actually have to be controversial. People do also pay attention to posts that just explain things that they find interesting and explain it well. Can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. Do you know before you are going to choose or when you are choosing these topics, what uh, might um, happen? So you're clear, okay, this is the topic that I'm going to write. Am I going to write it rather controversial? So uh, I know what uh, the responses might be, or am I going to write it this way? Or it's, is it something that you really think of before uh, creating the topic? Or does it just occur through, yeah, through, through your way of writing? I, I would say that I never aim to start fights. Um, I do definitely pick a topic sometimes because I think that it's controversial when people are interested, but I do always try to present it in a fair way that isn't going to start arguments. Um, among these posts where that actually triggered big arguments, um, I will say that, let's see, uh, one, two, three of them, three out of these five were posts that I didn't expect to cause any fight. I just expected I was explaining something I found interesting and that was it and it happened to cause a fight. Um, of the other ones, some of them are directly engaging with something someone else said and I kind of expected this guest post to be controversial. Um, but I mean, a lot of the other ones, you don't really know to start out whether I think you know whether people find something interesting and if people find something interesting, sometimes they do find it controversial, but I don't go out of my way to seek this kind of thing. I think that a better lesson to take is not that you want to seek controversy, but rather that you want to seek connections to others. So here's another perspective on where I'm getting my views. So this breaks things down by refers, by where people click to get to my blog. A lot of them just come in through search engines. There's a lot of Google terms where people end up on the blog. I think I checked today and there were a few people clicking based on is everything connected. Um, beyond that, I generally advertise my blog through Facebook and Twitter, but some of these Facebook views don't come from me. They come from this page, Physics World. This is an education site that occasionally posts links to my blog when they think it's going to be educational. And a lot of the rest of these are also connections with various bloggers. So here's Peter White's blog, Not Even Wrong. Here's Resonance. Here's the Bush model down here and a couple of other miscellaneous blogs, Small Town Physicists, Dispatches from Turtle Island. And these kinds of connections, they do bring in views. When a blogger puts you on their blog roll, that in and of itself, that list of links is going to get people to click over to say, okay, I like this blog, let's see what's on this other one. It's particularly noticeable for me for this blog, Resonance, because Resonance hasn't even posted in, I think, two years now, something like that. And before then, it hadn't posted for three years. Um, and yet still, every day, or yeah, literally perhaps every day, at least certainly many times a week, I get a few people clicking a link on Resonance to go to my blog. So once somebody does good work, that work being recognized means people will follow it, people will look for more good explanations, good popularization. And as long as you have these connections with other people, as long as you have these links, they can find it. Down at the bottom of this list, you can see a few sort of miscellaneous things like Tumblr, you should not expect to get a lot of views from Tumblr. I'm just on there for fun, personally. Um, archive, you might have heard there was some controversy at some point about so-called archive trackbacks. 
So if you if you link to an archive article in a newspaper in a news article, um, archive will have a link back on archive that says this happened. And there's been some sort of back and forth about whether this should include logs. So it still does in general, but I think um, at some point Peter Roy wasn't able to get track backs or something. So there was some fight about this that I don't really know much about. But anyway, as you can see, it's not actually that big a number compared to some of the other ways you can get views. Okay. So to kind of sum up my overall advice, to be clear, I don't actually want you to get into stupid arguments. Yes, they get you views, but they're stressful, they're annoying. You don't want them. What you should do first is try to communicate well. Budget your words. Don't use technical terms except when you need to. Have a few terms that give a vivid, crisp image. Beyond that, connect with other communicators. Find other people who communicate well and start conversations with them. Interact. That kind of interaction, not just stupid arguments, but any kind of interaction brings people in, keeps people's attention, and shows people how to find things that will teach them something. So that's how I would summarize my advice. And thank you for inviting me to talk.